Welcome back to Algorithmic Game Theory. Where are we so far? Well, we've introduced congestion games and we've shown that there is always a pure Nash equilibrium in congestion games. Then we've introduced more general normal form games and we have shown that there is always a mixed Nash equilibrium in such a normal form game if the number of players and the number of strategies per player is finite. But what we don't have so far is a polynomial time algorithm that lets us compute one of these equilibria. And indeed that's for a good reason, because it is generally hard to compute such an equilibrium. Um, but what does this mean to be hard? Does this mean these are NP-hard problems? Well, no, because NP, what, what, what kind of a complexity class is this? Um, a, NP is a complexity class about decision problems. So the answer will always be yes or no. But what kind of a question would this be? Because, well, the question, is there a pure Nash equilibrium in this congestion game? The answer will always be yes. So instead, this is a search problem, which is something, well, fundamentally different than the decision problems that we usually deal with in the context of complexity theory. So let's see what complexity theory can offer us for such search problems. What are possible complexity classes for search problems? So what are the, the problems like? Well, we are always given some kind of an input and then we'll have to search a solution to the, to the problem in our input or in general, the, um, the answer might also be, well, there is no such solution. Um, and there is the complexity class FP which stands for um, function polynomial. Uh, so this is what you know as N, uh, SP for decision problems, um, meaning that you can actually always find a solution within polynomial time. Then there's also the class of F N P. Um, how is this different? Well, this is now um, capturing what you actually know as N P in the context of decision problems. Here now, well, it might be difficult to find a solution, but verifying that you have a feasible solution that is somewhat easy. So the well, finding it is difficult, verifying that it is correct, that is, can be done in polynomial time. So kind of easy. Um, but, so what you could now hope is that finding an equilibrium, so finding a mixed Nash equilibrium in a normal form game or finding a pure Nash equilibrium in a congestion game that is and that this would be FNP hard. Well, this is not quite true, but it is indeed hard for subclasses of FNP, which are on the one hand PPAD, and on the other hand, we have PLS. So PPAD this is the this is a subclass of the problems which um, contains in particular finding a mixed Nash equilibrium 
in a normal form game and it turns out that this problem of finding an equilibrium is actually um, a PPAD complete problem. Whereas finding a pure Nash equilibrium in a congestion game, this is a PLS complete problem. Today we'll focus on the discussion about PLS, but I hope that then you see that, well, PPAD is a little more complicated to define, but eventually it is very similar uh, to what PLS looks like. And I hope you get an idea of how one can actually model such complexity classes. Now, there's one important thing, namely, how do you encode the input? And this is something that turns out to be important even uh, in the P versus NP question, so in the decision problems, because as you know, there's a notion like pseudo polynomial time, meaning that if you encode numbers in, in, in unary encoding, then suddenly, well, the knapsack problem becomes polynomial, the, the polynomial time solvable. And there's a similar effect here, namely, how do we encode our problem? And what do we even consider polynomial time? And there's one important thing about congestion games, namely that you can actually describe them very succinctly, that you, while a, for a general normal form game, you would, for a bimatrix game, you would usually just write down the entire table. But to encode a congestion game, you only have to specify the delay functions. And this takes m far less space in the input. And this is why um, you will actually see, well, going through the entire table of a bimatrix game, figuring out if any of these is a pure Nash equilibrium and which of these are, that's kind of easy. But in a congestion game, things are much more complicated just because um, the input itself is much smaller to represent this entire table. And we've already seen this in the context of um, the length of the improvement sequences that we had only one player, we had only m resources, uh, but still there were two to the m uh, different states, with all of which could, of course, might, of course, be a pure Nash equilibrium. Um, and this is very important to keep in mind that it always matters how you encode the input. So let's now come to the definition of the complexity class PLS. So how do we define a complexity class for a such problem? Well, this clearly depends on what kind of such problems we want to model. And for PLS, we, uh, we model problems uh, which are local such problems. And I hope this rings a bell because I, um, you might remember that um, pure Nash equilibria are exactly local minima of the Rosenthal potential. So all this is about is finding these local minima of the Rosenthal potential. How do we generally model such a local search problem? A local search problem Pi, capital Pi, is given by a set of instances. Which we call I subscript Pi. And 
And now every instance i in our script i sub pi um, has Well, on the one hand, we have a finite set of feasible solutions. Which we call f of i. Then we have an objective function. which we call C, which maps any feasible solution to an integer. And for every feasible solution, so for every um, S, in the set f of i, we have a neighborhood which we call n of s comma i, which is a subset of the feasible solutions. And now we call such a solution a local optimum if, well, there is no better solution in its neighborhood. So a solution S is a local optimum if um, no s prime in the neighborhood is better than s with respect to c, the objective function. So this might be a little um, informal at this point. Why am I informal? Because I'm not actually specifying whether I want to maximize or minimize the objective function. Um, so that's why I'm just simply writing better than s. So if we want to maximize our objective function, uh, then better means that to have a bigger value, if we have a minimization problem, then our objective um, is, of course, or the this here means that the objective function value should be smaller than this, or should not be small. So I hope you already realize that these pure natural equilibria, which we re um, which we well proved to be local minima of the Rosenthal potential, those we can actually also consider um, to be and uh, th this entire problem we can actually also consider to be such a local search problem. How that? Well, we'll have as the instances. Uh, the possible, uh, sorry, as the, um, as the feasible solutions, we have the possible states. The objective function will be the Rosenthal potential and the neighborhood will be the states that we reach if only one player deviates. Because this is how we define locality in the context of pure natural equilibria. But we can also define locality in an arbitrarily different way. And this is actually 
uh, will uh, be our first example, which will be a very different problem. But before we come to this, let's first define what it means for such a local search problem to be, uh, belong to the class PLS. Because PLS requires something about the problem to be solvable in polynomial time. What is this? So we now say that a local search problem pi belongs to the class PLS, which by the way stands for polynomial local search. if the following three algorithms exist. Well, we'll have algorithm A which is the following. Given an instance of a problem just return any feasible solution. Then we'll have algorithm B, given an instance and a feasible solution. we return C of S, so the objective function value. And there is algorithm C, which is the most complicated one. Given an instance, and a feasible solution either. Well, either we now say that uh, S is a local optimum Or we now return S prime from the neighborhood with a better objective function value. Okay, so how does it help us to have these three algorithms? Well, there is a pretty straightforward algorithm now to find a local minimum. Use algorithm A 
to start from anywhere and then use algorithm C to see, well, do I already have a local optimum or do I find something better in the neighborhood? And because the objective function value always improves while I'm doing this, after finite time, because there are only finitely many uh, feasible solutions, after finite time, I'm reaching a, um, a local optimum. So this is a truly simple algorithm, and what you see is that actually every iteration of this algorithm takes only polynomial time, because, well, you only run algorithms A, B, and C. But what is not clear is how many iterations you'll have in general. And this is exactly the thing that might not be polynomial, and will not be polynomial in many cases. So now we know the complexity class PLS and what we, were, what we have not seen is a, an example. Well, we've already seen that this looks pretty similar to these uh, pure natural equilibria and congestion games, but we'll come to this in more detail later on. But let's first see an, an example of a problem which is completely unrelated to game theory or seemingly unrelated to game theory, which is max cut. This is, turns out to be um, a PLS problem. And not only that, it will also be a PLS complete problem. And this is what we'll still have to define. What does it even mean for a problem to be a PLS complete? But let's first introduce max cut. So the problem max cut is defined as so we define this as a local search problem and we define it by well First of all, the instances we have to define. This is a graph with edge weights. Then we'll have feasible solutions This is any feasible solution is a cut And what is a cut? A cut always partitions the vertices of the graph into two sets, namely the set that we call left and the set that we call right. Then we'll have the objective function value. The objective function value of um, a cut is the sum of edge weights with one end point in left and the other one in right. And we'll have the neighborhood.
and we say that two cups are neighboring. If one can be obtained from the other, by moving only one vertex. between left and right. Okay, so let's see what this may look like. Our instances are graphs. So let's see one example of a graph. We'll have a vertex V1. We'll have a vertex V2. We'll have a vertex V3. And we'll have a vertex V4. And now we have some edges between them. So we'll have now six edges, and let's say that the weight of edge i is equal to i. So we'll now have different cuts in this graph. What is a cut? A cut is anything that splits these four vertices into two sets. So we might, for example, put all of these vertices on the left-hand side or only one of them on the left-hand side, the others on the right-hand side. Or we might even do something like this. Uh, we might take, for example, really this here on the left-hand side and this here on the right-hand side. We are free to do whatever we want to. What's the weight of this cut? Well, which of the edges do we cut? We cut E1, we cut E5, we cut E6, and we cut E3. So what's the weight of this cut? This will be 1 plus 5 plus 6 plus 3 so this will be 15. Good. Is this a local optimum? Well, what are neighboring cuts? What could we do? We could, for example, uh, move V3 from left to right, or V1 we could move from left to right, or v4 we could move from right to left or v2 we could move from right to left and if you now do this here you will see okay this is actually a local optimum because if you now move v1 then you gain 1 plus 4 but you lose sorry you do not gain this 
uh, one, but instead, how much do you gain? Well, you gain now this four, but at the same time, you lose one and six. So this is not a good idea. Or you could move B3, then how much do you gain? Well, again, you gain four, but you lose five plus three. So that's also a bad idea. Or you could move four, then you gain two, but you lose three and six. That's also a bad idea. Or you could move V2, then you gain two, um, but you lose one and five. So none of these is actually a good idea. This is why this is a local optimal. But indeed, it is not a global optimal. Because if we did, if we did the cut like this, then suddenly, um, we have a weight of four plus five plus six plus two crossing the cut, which if I'm not mistaken is 70. So this is better in terms of the objective function uh, as a cut, but it is not a neighboring cut to the, to the one we considered before. So that's why also the first one that we were considering is a local optimum, although it is not a global optimum. Okay. And now it turns out, well, I hope you're almost convinced because you may have seen um, that it is kind of easy to verify that a cut is a local optimum or to, to make changes so that it becomes better um, in the, um, with, uh, by, by just one change. And this means that max cut is a PLS problem. So to prove this, we would of course have to once again show that all these three algorithms exist. Well, we will have, we will need to have an algorithm that gives us any feasible solution. Okay, that's easy. Um, just put all the resistors to the set left, for example. You need to be able to compute the objective function value. Well, that is also easy. You just have to, to sum the values up. And then you have to verify that a, um, a solution is a local optimum or that uh, you, you have to devise an, a local improvement. Well, then you actually only have to consider every single vertex and ask what happens if I move it to the other side. Exactly um, as I did this in, in our example just a second ago. And this can also be done in polynomial time. And this is why this is a PLS problem. However, it is not only a PLS problem, it is PLS complete. What do we mean by PLS completeness? Well, this is something we still have to prove, uh, to define. Um, because there is also a notion of a reduction in the PLS sense, which is kind of similar to the reductions that you know for, uh, for NP, but things are a little different here because you do not only have to transform instances, but you also have to transform solutions back. Let's see how this works. So if we're given two PLS problems, which we will call pi one and pi two, there is a PLS 
reduction which we write that pi 1 is reducible to pi 2 or you might also read this as P, pi 1 is not harder than P, pi 2 in the PLS sense if there are two polynomial time algorithms F and G with the following properties. Algorithm F maps every instance to an instance uh, to every instance of pi 1 to an instance of pi 2. Good. And algorithm G maps every local optimum S of f of i to a local optimum g s of i. Good. Let's digest this for a bit. Um, and let's also keep in mind how this works for NP because there we kind of use um, a similar notion of reduction um, which also transforms instances from one problem into instances of another problem. But as I was saying, things are a bit different here because um, how are things different? Well, we have now two PLS problems and now we turn an instance of the first problem into an instance of the second problem. And then we have another algorithm that turns a local optimum of the second problem into a local um, optimum of the first problem. This is kind of implicit in the um, in the polynomial reduction as we use it for to define NP because there we have the constraint that the way we map instances um, yes instances have to stay yes instances no instances have to stay no instances well here of course this all doesn't make any sense so that's why we ask uh, for this second algorithm to exist that somehow um, whenever we have a local optimum for the second problem, then we can, can turn this back into a, pro, uh, a local optimum of the first problem. Why is this meaningful? Because one way of constructing an, an algorithm for pi 1, if we have already an algorithm for pi 2, is as follows. Compute f of i then run an algorithm on that well solves f of i gives us a local solution local optimum for f of i and then turn it back into a local optimum of i and of course you see if uh, we have a polynomial time algorithm for pi 2 and we have a reduction of pi 1 to pi 2 then we'll also have a polynomial time algorithm for pi 1. And like in NP completeness, we now say that a problem is called PLS complete 
if there is a reduction from every PLS problem to it. So we say that a problem pi star in PLS is called PLS complete if for every problem pi in PLS it holds that pi is PLS reducible to pi star. Once again this sign you can always read as is no harder than. Um, so this means every problem in PLS is no harder than, in the PLS sense, is no harder than pi star, which also means that, well, as I was sketching this, if we had a polynomial time algorithm to solve a local minimum for pi star, then we could actually, we would have a polynomial time algorithm to find a local optimum for any problem pi in PLS. Another thing is about max cut. That max cut is PLS complete. So unfortunately we won't prove this theorem in class, um, but we will see that this is actually very important for us because why is this important? Now to show PLS completeness of any other problem, we don't actually have to show this kind of a master reduction from any problem to whatever we want to show PLS completeness of, but we'll only have to show, um, we'll only have to show that max cut reduces to whatever, whatever other problem we have here. Because then we can just use um, transitivity of the reduction relation. So this is what we want to do next. We want to see that actually finding a pure Nash equilibrium in a congestion game can be reduced to PLS. Well, first of all, we have to once again say that this is a PLS problem and then we show a reduction and this then proves that it is actually hard to find such a PLS problem, to find such a pure Nash equilibrium under the assumption that PLS isn't equal to FP, that there are problems in PLS which are not polynomial time solver. So let's now talk about PLS completeness of finding pure Nash equilibria in general congestion games. And before we do, we, before we discuss the reduction, we of course have to once again uh, observe why this is a PLS problem. I mentioned this before. But once again, right, let's write this down. It is a PLS problem to find a pure Nash equilibrium
in a congestion game. Why is this? Once again, this is because pure Nash equilibria are a local minima of the Rosenthal potential. So how do we turn, how do we write this as a PLS problem? What are uh, our instances? Well, that's a, every instance uh, is a congestion game, um, including resources and delay functions. What are feasible solutions? Feasible solutions are simply states. So every player chooses one strategy. What are, uh, what are the neighboring solutions? Well, one player moves unilaterally from his or her strategy to a different strategy. And what's the objective function? The objective function is the Rosenthal potential. And it is important now that we are now talking about local minima. Whereas in the case of max cut, we are actually were interested in, uh, uh, we were actually interested in local maxima. And that's something I should have mentioned also earlier that finding a local minimum for a cut solution, that is actually somewhat, uh, this is actually not a PLS hard problem. It is even a polynomial time problem um, because you may know algorithms to compute a min cut. So only computing a max cut is difficult. Uh, whereas now our goal is actually to minimize the Rosenthal potential. So um, this I think is sometimes a little difficult to see here. And at least to me, this, all, this is also what makes these proofs that, uh, or the one proof that we will go through now most confusing, that we actually have to turn a minimization problem into a maximization problem and vice versa. So what we now claim is that max cut is no harder in the PLS sense than the problem of finding a pure Nash equilibrium in congestion games. Good. What do we have to do to prove this? Well, we are not given an instance of a max cut uh, of max cut, and we'll have to turn this into a congestion game, so that a pure Nash equilibrium of this congestion game corresponds to a local minimum of the max cut problem. Good, let's do this. Fortunately for us, max cut is rather easy to describe because we have only the graph and the edge weights. We are given this graph and the edge weights. We said that these edge weights are non negative. Um, and now we define the congestion game. As follows. Well, what are the players? The players correspond to the vertices of the graph. For each edge, we introduce 
two resources. One resource that is called left and one resource that is called right. And its delay function is as follows for both the left and the right resource. We say that the delay is zero if only one player is using it. But it is WE if at least two players are using this. And now every player, which means a vertex from our graph. has now two strategies. Namely, they can play the left strategy, which means they take all the resources, um, all the left resources, uh, the edges whose endpoints they are, or they can take all the right resources of the, edge, uh, of the edges whose endpoints they are. Good. Now, this means that a stage or a strategy profile of our game corresponds immediately to cut. Why that? Because every player has the choice between two strategies and the strategy means exactly what it claims to mean, namely it means either left or it means right. Good, so now what still needs to be done is actually to say, well, how do we get from any um, from any local optimum of this game back to a max cut solution. And well, it is pretty obvious how we should do this. Uh, namely, well, take any, um, see what the respective players are doing and turn this into the respective cut. But how, what does this mean regarding the objective function value? This is what we still have to discuss. Um, so the cuts are first of all in in one-to-one -one correspondence with the states or the strategy profiles, but. What does this now, how, how is it, what, what's the, how's the weight of a cut mapped to the Rosenthal potential and vice versa? So if we consider a cut of weight W, the Rosenthal potential of the associated state is how much? Well, how do we get now the, the Rosenthal potential? We have some players using, or some vertices being on the left-hand side, some of them being on the right-hand side, so some being uh, using the left strategy, some using the right strategy. Now it turns out don't forget what the delay functions look like. That the Rosenthal potential 
is exactly well how what would we do we would take the sum over all resources and then uh, take the sum of all players up to the number of players using this resource and then add up the respective delay values how big are these delay values well for every resource every resource is an edge in our graph so only two players, uh, only up to two players may use this resource. Good. Now, if only one of these players uses this resource, the delay is zero. So this means that this term here, this is exactly WE if both endpoints are on the same side and zero otherwise. And this means that this Rosenthal potential is nothing but the sum of all edge weights of the edges that are not cut. And this means this is nothing but the sum of all edge weights overall minus the sum of the uh, edge weights of the edges that are cut. Once again, where is this coming from? The important thing is this part here that actually um, the contribution of one edge to the Rosenthal potential is exactly WE if both endpoints are on the same side because then we'll have we will always have here only zeros up to the point where k equals 2 k equals 3 will never happen because only two uh, two players may use a resource anyway so it only matters whether we have k equals 2 or not in this sum here. And this is, it means exactly we have k equals 2 exactly if both endpoints are on the same side. So due to this one-to-one -one correspondence, we therefore immediately have that Local, min, local maxima of max cut correspond to local minima of the Rosenthal potential. Good. And this already concludes our proof. So once again, maybe let's see what this visually looks like. This is the example that we had earlier. How would we now construct a congestion game? Well, we would now have in total 12 resources because we have six edges. So we'll have the resource R left E1 and R right E1. We'll have R left E2 and we'll have R right E2. We'll have R left E3 and R right E3 R left E4 and R right E4 
has R left, D5 and R right, E5, R left, E6 and R left, sorry, R right, E6. Good. Now, what does a cut look like? So, once again, let's consider this cut. What strategies are the players using? Well, the blue player, the V1 player, is on the left. So, he's using the left resource of E1, E4, and E6. Then we'll have the red player who's on the right. So they are using E1 right, E5 right, and E2 right. There's the orange player. The orange player is again the orange player is again on the left, so he's using e4, e5, and e3. And that's the green player. The green player is on the right, so they are using the right resource of e2, E6 and E3. And where are we now? Well, now each of these um, pairs of resources is used by exactly two players and all that matters is how do the two players split up between the two sides. So what we see here is that if an edge is not cut, then the two players are using the same resource. If it is cut, then they are using different resources. What does the Rosenthal potential look like? Well, we'll have um, only one player on each of the uh, resources corresponding to E1, so those won't contribute anything to the Rosenthal potential because the delay is zero. Here for E2, this is different because there are both players on this resource, so we'll have a contribution of zero for the first player and then of two for the second player. So this gives us already a Rosenthal potential of two. For three, five and six, it is just what we know um, that while well, only one of the players uh, is using every of these resources, uh, so th those won't contribute anything. Whereas for E4, this is again different. Both players are using this left resource. Um, so we'll get a contribution of four to the Rosenthal potential. So if we take the sum, then we'll get overall a Rosenthal potential of six. And where is this coming from? Well, this is exactly nothing but uh, the sum of the uh, way, uh, edge weights of the edges that are not cut. And the edges that are cut, those have one plus five plus six plus three. This was, I hope you remember, 15 and Overall, the sum of all of our edge weights, this is um, 21. So, by the way, what you see here is that this is, well, it is a congestion game, but it is not a network congestion game. 
we the the our many of our examples uh, of congestion games were actually network congestion games so we had a source and a sink in a network and players wanted to get from the source to the sink um, maybe they have different sources and sinks uh, or they, these are all they are all the same then this is a symmetric network condition so you might not ask, well, is it also hard to compute an equilibrium in a network congestion game? Well, generally, yes, it is. Um, because you can somehow transform all of this also into a construction that works in a graph with sources and sinks. But this will not be a symmetric network congestion game. And this is for a good reason, because we already have a polynomial time algorithm to compute a pure natural equilibrium in a network congestion game. And that's why it is very unlikely for this problem uh, to be also PLS hard, PLS complete, because this would mean that um, PLS is equal to FP. Good. So this completes our study of the uh, hardness of equilibria. Um, we've got to know a complexity class, PLS. And as I was saying, there's a similar complexity class, PPAD, um, to capture the hardness of mixed Nash equilibria in normal form games. This is all a little more annoying, I want to say, to define, but eventually it is not a lot different. Um, so I hope that you get the spirit. Of course, this is actually somewhat disappointing that we now see, okay, computing equilibria is hard, because this means, well, why should the players even play such an equilibrium if it is hard to find? How, how should these players have the amazing ability to find this equilibrium. Well, fortunately for us, there are other equilibrium concepts which are easier com to compute. These we will introduce next time. And then eventually everything that we will do afterwards holds for actually all of these equilibrium concepts, these easy ones, as well as the ones that are easier to compute, uh, which generalize Nash equilibrium. So this is what we will do next time. Uh, hope to see you then, or hope that you're still watching then. And if there are any questions in the meantime, pl please do let me know and have a nice day. Bye.